Hi, I'm Ralph. And I'm Dr Jen, and this is Awesome Astronomy on YouTube. And in this show, we're going to look at the thousands of new planets we've discovered only in the last 30 years. Now, you might think that Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune are the only planets there are. You might also think that Pluto is a planet. It's not. It's time to move on. But you might have also heard of exoplanets, and that's what this show is all about. Exo, Greek for external or beyond the solar system, and planets meaning, well, planets. So let us start by taking you back to 1991. Only 30 years ago you had mobile phones, you could buy laptops, and your preferred method of conveyance wasn't too different from today. But even on the 31st of December 1991, we had no concrete discovery, no evidence whatsoever of the existence of any planets other than the familiar ones in our solar system. Despite there being 400 billion stars in our home galaxy and a trillion trillion stars in all of the galaxies of the observable universe, our Sun was the only one where we had definitive evidence of there being planets. But thinking about planets elsewhere really began all the way back in the 15th century, it may surprise you to hear, with that great thinker of the time, Copernicus, who proved that the Earth was not at the centre of the universe. Although Copernicus and Kepler did think that the Sun was at the centre of the universe, and then all of the stars were simply vastly distant, immovable points of light, there were others who thought quite differently, quite modern thoughts actually. He's a little bit of a forgotten soul, but his name is Giordano Bruno, and he was a philosopher, a mathematician, an astronomer. He was also into the occult, because why not? It's the 15th century. And it's to him where we get the first thoughts of there being planets elsewhere. He considers all of the stars in the sky to be just like the sun, and have planets orbiting them in their own right. Sadly, he was burned alive for being a heretic in 1600, showing that they took a really strong line when it came to smart Alex. Of course, back in the 15 and 1600s, it was impossible to see planets around other stars, so they could only be dreamt up or theorised. They were so impossibly far away that no telescopes were powerful or sensitive enough to see them. Even when they were eventually detected, they were more inferred than observed. But to give you an idea of how difficult it is to see any planets around other stars, we need to talk about how far away the stars are. The Voyager spacecraft was launched on a rocket in 1977, and it took 35 years to reach the boundary of our solar system. But because of how far away the nearest star is to us, if Voyager were going in the right direction, it would take it another 74,000 years to get there. And that's just our nearest star, which in terms of the whole galaxy is no distance at all. In fact, many exoplanets are hundreds or even thousands of times further away than that. So being able to see a planet in the glare of its star that itself could only be seen as a pinprick of light just wasn't possible in Copernicus or Bruno's time, or even ours until 2004. So that meant astronomers had to wait until they had equipment that was sensitive enough to either detect impossibly far away stars gentle wobble as their planets gravitationally tugged on them, or to see the impossibly minuscule dimming of a star's light as a planet passed in front of it as it orbited the star. For Pope Clement VIII, this sadly meant waiting 387 years to find out that Giordano Bruno was right and his bonfire in 1600 was a bit extra. But the ironically named Clement couldn't wait that long and died of gout in 1605. But in 1992, astronomers witnessed something remarkable. They were studying a pulsar called PSR 1257 plus 12, very catchy name, and they discovered something completely unexpected. So pulsars are the remnants of massive stars which have died in supernova explosions. And these stars are extraordinarily compact and they spin very quickly, so we're talking hundreds of times a second. 
They also have very powerful magnetic fields and the combination of these powerful magnetic fields with the very rapid spinning drives really powerful jets that emanate from the poles of the magnetic field. And these jets, they can sweep across Earth a bit like a deep space lighthouse. And this sweeping is always very regular for a pulsar. But for PSR 1257 plus 12, it wasn't so regular. And that was because planets were tugging on the pulsar, making it wobble and delaying these jets coming across Earth ever so slightly. Of course, the pulsar is not a very great environment. There's lots of radiation, very fast moving and high energy particles. So we're probably not likely to find ET around there. Interestingly, one of the discoverers of the first ever exoplanet was outed as an informant for the Polish secret police under the Soviet regime. Not alone in this murky world, Edmund Halley, who discovered the famous comet named after him, was a spy. A number of astronomers worked on the Manhattan Project to develop the atom bomb, and Isaac Newton and Fritz Zwicky, who coined the term supernova, were bullies of spectacular accomplishment. But with the first discovery of planets outside our solar system, a new and exciting branch of astronomy was born, and the first exoplanet around a star happily burning away for billions of years like our own sun, what we call a main sequence star, wasn't found until 1995, around a star called 51 Pegasi, which you can actually go outside and see for yourselves in autumn or winter. You don't even need a telescope or binoculars. Since this discovery, astronomers naturally got really excited about finding more alien worlds around other stars, and funding bodies started building new instruments and telescopes to look for new exoplanets. Because we wanted to know how many are there? How many stars have planets around them? Are there star systems with multiple planets like our solar system? Do we see the diversity of large, gassy, small, rocky and ringed planets around other stars? And the big one, of course, are any of them habitable? And that meant we built loads of new telescopes and instruments throughout the 1990s and this century. Of the observatories down here on Earth, the robotic observatory WASP has found almost 120 to date. The HARP spectrograph, an instrument attached to the 3.6 metre telescope high up in the Chilean Atacama Desert, has detected more than 130 planets around other stars. The first prodigious space telescope was called CORO, which launched in 2006 and has found over 600 exoplanet candidates. NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite has only been watching far away stars for three years, but has already identified more than 2,400 exoplanet candidates. But the big daddy is NASA's Kepler Space Telescope, which confirmed almost 3,000 distant planets and gave us our richest picture of the extremes of other worlds out there. Most of the early exoplanet discoveries were of planets which have no parallels in our solar system. They were massive, Jupiter-sized or even bigger planets on scorchingly close orbits around their host star. We're talking a day or two, well within the orbit of Mercury in our own solar system. And this kind of illustrates how difficult it is to find planets elsewhere. The stars are just so far away and the planet signals are really small. I mean, we only have to think about our own solar system, right? And we've known about planets in our own solar system for centuries. And yet Eris, which is the 10th largest body in the solar system, we didn't find that until 2005. And of course, this was much to the annoyance of all the Pluto files out there because it was the discovery of Eris which led to Pluto being demoted from being a planet. Whereas Ralph said in the introduction, it is time to get over that now. But in those early days of exoplanet discoveries, it became apparent that the preponderance of those Jupiter or super Jupiter sized worlds orbiting very close to their own stars was largely a collection bias. Giant planets were easier to spot because, well, they're big. And planets that are closer to their stars orbit faster, so you can watch multiple orbits to confirm a discovery much faster if a planet is closer to its star. You'd wait 36 years to observe Jupiter orbiting our Sun. But one planet twice the size of Jupiter has been observed orbiting so close to its star that it chalked up three orbits in two and a half days. Then, as the hunt continued, we started seeing more Uranus and Neptune-sized worlds, 
a few worlds closer to Earth's size and more gas giants further out from their stars. Until finally today, after confirming more than four and a half thousand planets around distant stars, we get a rich answer to those questions we asked earlier. How many are there? Well, we know there are thousands, but probably billions. How many stars have planets around them? Well, on average, every star has at least one planet in its orbit. Are there star systems with multiple planets like our solar system? Yes, uh, a fifth of all stars we've seen planets around have more than one planet. The star Kepler 90 has as many planets as our solar system. Do we see the diversity of large, gassy, small, rocky and ringed planets around other stars? Yeah, we do. And the majority seem to be between the size of Earth and Uranus. And then the big question, are any of them habitable? Well, again, the answer is yes. To be considered potentially habitable, they have to be rocky, similar in size to the Earth, and the right distance from their star for water to exist in all its forms, ice, liquid, and vapor. And we know of dozens that fit that bill. So now that we're all excited at the possibility of life being able to exist on dozens of other worlds, and that's just the worlds we've observed, there'll be millions or billions more we haven't seen yet. What are we doing to find out if those potentially habitable worlds are actually habited? Well, there are three ways we can know with confidence. We can peer into their atmospheres with a technique called spectroscopy that allows us to tell what the atmosphere is made of. If it has certain molecules such as ozone, methane or phosphine, these are good indicators of bacterial or animal metabolism. Not conclusive, but they will tell us where to conduct further study. But this search for biosignatures needs incredibly precise telescopes, and the good news is that the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite that we mentioned earlier, and other exoplanet hunting telescopes, have been picking the ideal atmospheres for these next generation telescopes to examine. And the James Webb Space Telescope, launched later this year, or in 2021 if you're looking back on this video, and the European Southern Observatory's extremely large telescope due to begin operation in 2027 are up to the job and have astronomers salivating. And the second way we can know if a planet is habited with confidence is the one that would tell us for sure, visiting it with a crude or robotic spacecraft. But as it'd take hundreds of thousands of years to reach the closest habitable world with conventional rockets, that's just beyond our technological capabilities and is going to be for decades, if not hundreds of years. So that leaves us with the final way we can tell if a distant world is inhabited, listening to it. Every time we observe a potentially habitable world, the not-for-profit organization called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which began as a NASA program to listen for alien signals, swings its radio detectors over to it to listen for anything that might be coming from an intelligent life form. If you've seen the film Contact, it's just like that. SETI is staffed by credible scientists and it's always researching new signals to look for like faint radio frequencies or laser communications that would reveal the existence of intelligent life if it was being beamed from a faraway planet. It's a long shot that requires patience, but if it does ever find an alien signal, well, that'll be the biggest discovery in all of human history. But tell us what you think. Will SETI detect any alien signals? Will the James Webb Space Telescope or the Extremely Large Telescope find interesting biosignatures in the atmospheres of distant worlds? Start the conversation by putting your thoughts in the comments below.